Have you ever noticed how painted images are all around us? That's where I come in. I'm a curator at an art gallery. I choose paintings for people to look at. And I'm on a mission. To show you why looking is worth it. To show you why painting matters. It can challenge you, play with you, and even lift your soul. Come with me on this journey through art and you'll see the world through new eyes. When you think about it, we've all been given a pretty short time on this planet. So why should we use it to look at paintings? From day one, the clock is counting down. We try and fill each moment with as much as possible. And quite often, spare time seems like the greatest luxury of all. For most of us, living in cities, working nine to five or longer, terminally distracted by all of this, how do we find a clearing in the chaos? How do we find that moment of quality time? How do we find a space to really see and really think? It's a fast-paced world out there. And when we visit big cities, there seems to be even less time for everything. We race from one thing to the next and try to cram in the sights. We're always running short of time to stop and take stock of our lives. But for centuries, there is one group that has stopped time dead and made us think about our own existence. Painters. A gleaming pile of human stuff, boxes, music, shells. But the skull is what makes this a vanitas painting. They were painted for wealthy merchants in the 17th century. Vanitas, translated from Latin, means emptiness. The paintings depict the meaninglessness of earthly life and its possessions. We can't take it all with us when time runs out. In today's rapid fire world, some painters address these old time themes in new ways. Faced with things that move very fast, they make paintings that move very slow. But to appreciate these paintings, one thing you cannot do is rush. So this is a story about the dangers of rushing and the pleasures of taking your time. I was on my way to see a show. I was rushing in and flying out in one day. And it was an exhibition by an artist who makes time. Legendary Polish painter Roman Opolka. The room was filled with canvases covered in numbers, as if Opolka was a timekeeper, counting patiently with the brush. But I felt impatient. I found it hard to locate the slower gear that those paintings required. And in fact, I began to feel a little bored. Before long, I was out of time and dashing for the airport. But as I waited for my plane, sitting still at last, I got thinking about the paintings. About the moments that add up to a life. About the numbers we live by, the minutes in a day, days in a year. About Opelka counting out every moment like a precious thing. Suddenly, his paintings felt hugely poignant and profound. In a simple way, this was an artist asking that dizzying, fundamental question, how much time do we have? The lesson is that to hear what a painting is asking or saying, you have to find your patch of silence in the chaos. A clearing where there's a chance for a painting to unfold. Some of my best gallery going encounters have occurred on days when a meeting has been cancelled or a flight's been postponed and I've found myself with a couple more hours than expected. Not enough time to plan some major cultural encounter, but enough time to slow down, go somewhere that feels a world away from the city, a place where the normal rules of rush don't apply. And the painters I'm drawn to on those days don't portray big historical encounters or earth-shaking events. They portray moments of still time in ordinary rooms. Now, this work 
by the French intimist Pierre Bonnard is exactly that. Bonnard is called an intimist because he painted intimate, everyday scenes. His gift was to make ordinary moments extraordinary. In the window, the least promising things spring to life. Colour seems to pulse through the tablecloth, the shutter. Out the window, everything wobbles as if melting in the heat. And barely visible, the painting's subject takes it all in. It's an ordinary day, ordinary room, an ordinary moment. But Bonnard takes that moment, he stills it, and he ensures with those wobbly outlines and that slow burning colour that is his trademark, that this intimate moment is kept alive. Bonnard's one of those artists who leaves you feeling quieter and calmer, refreshed before the long trip home. And I've still got time for the other thing I love to do on my last day overseas, buy some toys for the kids. There's absolutely no shortage here. A gazillion different video games, sci-fi gadgets, and soft toys with personalities of their own. But I'm not after something high tech today. I'm after something more old school, and this is it. Sometimes old school is the freshest thing around, and it doesn't come fresher than French painter Chardin who made paintings of children immersed in moments of stopped time. My favourite is Soap Bubbles, painted 270 years ago. A young man leans on a windowsill with a glass of soapy water, blows gently through a straw and produces a gleaming bubble. It takes a moment to notice the younger boy peeking over at what his brother has made. We feel the little boy's desire to see. He wants to witness the small miracle of the bubble before it disappears. And Chardin's worked his own small miracle as well, conjuring a soapy sphere with a few strokes of white. A moment caught and held. Everything they say about time is true. You've got to watch it or it'll float on by. But by taking ordinary moments and making them last, painters remind us to pause and take time to look at what matters, in the gallery and beyond. Time and painting go hand in hand. For centuries, painters have addressed how much time we have on Earth and how to spend it. Some painters succeed in stilling a moment, painting a bubble of time so carefully it never bursts. But there's another question of time. How long should you spend looking? Every day of the week, every hour of the day, everyone's leading a busy life. The speed and the bustle have a way of distracting us from some of life's simplest pleasures. And of all those pleasures, looking at paintings is usually way down the list. So many things are saying, fill your day with me. I get to the top of this escalator, am I going to check my emails, take the dog for a walk, have some fun with the kids? Which one do you choose? And painting, poor, modest, quiet painting, doesn't seem very urgent at all. But that's the point. Painting doesn't hit us hard and fast. It filters in, it takes its time. For me, museums and galleries are like time machines. We rush in out of the ordinary world and find ourselves surrounded by some of the slowest things around, paintings. And something happens. We slow down to look because paintings have the power to talk to us across time. And the maker of this painting is almost 300 years gone. Yet when I step up to this floral still life, it feels as though he's only 30 centimetres away. It's as if the artist is talking to me 300 years into the future, 
and the way he caught my attention, the way he called out to me, was with detail. Now that I'm looking, I notice he's built his bouquet from flowers that bloom in different seasons. It's an arrangement that would never occur in nature. Another trick of time. The longer you look at a painting, the more you start to see in it. Which raises big questions. Like exactly how long should you spend looking at a painting? Will five minutes give you all you need? Now, whenever you ask these questions, someone turns up and unfurls a sheet full of depressing statistics. The average viewer spends five seconds with a painting. The average viewer spends 26 seconds with a painting. And what I hate about these statistics is that they leave out two crucial things. How intense the experience is and how long it keeps percolating in memory. Some paintings grab you straight away, while others don't. At first glance, I don't see a lot to look at here. But before moving on, you've always got to ask, what game is this artist playing? What rules is this particular painting playing by? At first, it looks like a corporate logo, cold and calculated. But when I spend a little longer, I start to see more. Like how the artist, Gordon Walters, makes each form flow into the one below. There's more here than I first thought, but I'm still not convinced. Is this a game I want to keep playing? Is it worth the time? I take a third look, because that's part of the game. And that's when I start to see all sorts of things. I notice how all the shapes are working together. Colour moves down through a gap and spreads outward, creating a calm, tidal rhythm, constantly changing but perfectly balanced. By looking not once but three times, I've discovered this painting isn't cold at all. It's revealing something much bigger about life, harmony and change. Taking time with paintings is hugely rewarding. And often the biggest rewards come from paintings that don't shout to be looked at. Like these small works in a small room by the too little known artist Barbara Tuck. You walk in here and you might think, same, 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 same. Close hues, they look ochre, they look brown, they're not leaping off the wall and grabbing you by the lapels. But I've been standing here 15 minutes and like an old valve radio, this show is slowly warming up. It starts with the small things. Horizons in unusual places. Waterfalls that curl ornately. In fact, the whole landscape is pouring and flowing. Distant forests suddenly flower into plant life that might have come from the salad bar. What looked like a bland brown view turns into an elaborate journey unfolding. They are not paintings that it's possible to grab in one gulp and leave the gallery knowing everything about. You have to be there and see them and spend time to take in all the subtleties. If you still need convincing that taking time matters, then let's go and see one of New Zealand's most practised makers of paintings that take time. Michael Smither often spends months on a single painting, catching moments that usually flip past or fade away. He's also spent lots of time looking at painting and is especially enchanted with one by 19th century Frenchman Georges Seurat. We have here the painting itself, a Sunday afternoon on Le Grand Jatte. What took you to this work? Why, why this work? At the time, I had a friend who was an artist who lived in Chicago, and this happened to be in Chicago. So I talked her into uh, letting me use her flat and went down to the gallery every day. So you were just sitting and looking at this work? I spent two weeks with it. Two weeks? Yeah, roughly, um, just about every day. To me, it was a painting which was a very, very skillful composition and involved everything that he knew about art he put into this painting. I mean, he could compose paintings like nobody else could. That, I think, is, uh, is the, the thing that I learnt most from Seurat. Seurat captures an everyday moment like no one before. And what makes this painting sing is his use of colour. 
From a distance, his waterside scene is perfectly ordered, carefully composed. But come in close and every object atomizes into countless dabs of colour, thousands of swarming, swimming dots. After having seen this picture, my life changed as an artist, you know. Michael came home with fresh eyes for the ordinary world. In his series after Seurat, he celebrates Seurat's technique, plunging the eye in bright colours that evoke light playing on a local waterside. My idea for an art gallery, for instance, in New Zealand would be to build one art gallery and then buy this painting and put it in it, and that, that would be it. Paintings of everyday scenes have the power to unfold into something profound. And inside this old building is such a painting. It's a big portrait by artist Jude Ray. And the silent star of the painting is this woman, Nada. Sitting looking into the light from a barely noticeable window, she appears to be doing nothing. Alone in the room, her world separated from ours by a drape. Jude has made a space that invites us to observe her. It's a device that marks the distance between our space and this contemplative space that Nada inhabits. And it connects this woman with some of the most famous time-out zones in all art by 17th century painter Johannes Vermeer. Vermeer painted silent indoor worlds, people calmly inhabiting their own thoughts. In Nada, Jude does something similar. She invites us to look into this woman's world. And when I do, I start to wonder about her. Who is she and what's her life like? She looks like someone who's worked hard and seen a few things in her time. But her gaze isn't sad or regretful. It's alert and independent. I think if you aimed a sentimental thought at this person, she'd bat it straight back at you. The longer I look at Nada, the more I realise she's not doing nothing. She's looking, waiting and thinking. We can't see what she's looking at, but we can see how intently she's looking. And that's the point. What matters is the way we look at things, the quality of our attention, the time we take to see. Painters have always addressed the passing of time, taking on the big questions of life and death. They also love to still time, holding on to tiny moments forever. And the more time you spend looking at painting, the more you see and the richer the experience gets. But the big question is, truly and finally, how do you look at a painting? Our journey through the art world is nearly over and we're back where we started, at Christchurch Art Gallery. The art world might have seemed like a baffling place back then, but if I've done anything right, you should feel like your art journey is just beginning. But before you get up and get looking, here are a few tips about how to look at a painting. Fill your own art room. That space we all have within us for the paintings that have changed us. The fuller your image banks are with paintings you remember, the richer your responses will be to new ones. Your art room is where you store memories of your favourite paintings. Paintings you associate with moments in your life. It could be a portrait that reminds you of someone close, a landscape that brings back your favourite holiday, or a vision that's like somewhere you dreamed of. Remember there's often more to see than you might think. So if you're troubled by a lack in a painting, a lack of detail, a lack of colour, ask yourself what the artist was inviting you to notice in its absence. So when there's not much there, no tree, no face, no storybook image, take a moment to consider what is there. Instead of worrying about the meanings hidden behind the surface, look hard at the surface itself and you'll start to see richness, variety, shadow and light where you least expected it. Observations before opinions. Instead of rushing in and saying, what do I think of this work of art, ask yourself what you notice. When this painting first went on show, people were scandalised. They said it was a total blackout. But get close to that surface 
and you'll see that Colin McCann has graded his greys and beautifully blurred those blacks, evoking a view from the window of a moving car through Northland as the light begins to fade. One painting seen well beats dozens seen in a state of perspiration, frustration and rush. And remember that it won't all be good. Ugh. If a painting's giving you nothing, there's no shame in turning your back. Remember, though, that if you don't occasionally wade through art's lows, you're hardly qualified to register the highs. Trust your own impressions. If all a painting does is remind you of something personal, that's a great thing. So if you come into the gallery and these two people in a painting from hundreds of years ago by Rayburn remind you of Auntie May, and Uncle Fred, all well and good. And leave your preconceptions at the door because painting often turns up where you least expect it. And when it does, it won't always look like painting, like these stairs. It might not be on canvas. Painting's a permanent work in progress and there's no telling where it will flow next. Please. Look for connections between the old and the new. This painting by Bill Hammond from the 1990s is based on one by Bruegel from the 1550s. But what matters is not that one belongs in the historical camp and the other in the contemporary. What matters is whether a painting is alive or not alive whenever it was made. Respect the thing. The thing is the painting. It's the physical thing the artists labor over. And the artists are why we're here. They are the makers in a world of ways. From bodies, to faces, to places. And they delve deep, taking on big questions like religion and humanity's place in the world. They try to capture the spirit of place, the hidden shapes of nature, the play of life. Paintings can be playful, experimental, and they can be ambitious, trying to shout loudly and take on the world's problems. But when the makers put away their brushes, the painting still isn't finished. It takes two people to complete the work of art. The other person needed is you. If there's one final lesson to take away, it's this. Take your time. It takes time to find a painting worth looking at, and it takes time to feel your way into the world of that painting. But that's the point. Painting isn't something to be solved and shelved and put away before you move on to more urgent items of business. It's a way of coming to your senses, tuning up your vision, staying open and alert to the world. And the things that matter in the world can often drift on by if you're not paying attention. But in comes the painter, quietly gets our attention and says something simple and profound. Look at this. Take the time to really look and you'll see the world through new eyes. Okay, bubble guys.